now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Classic Movie Reviews with Snark. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All I ask is that you jump over to iTunes and give me a review. Today's movie is The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962, and it's a great western, perhaps the greatest of all time. It shows the struggle between the open-range cattle barons and the new town folks looking to have a quiet life. The cast for this movie is outstanding in terms of westerns, but it's an amazing cast by any standard. First, I'll run through the actors we have seen before. These include John Wayne, who played the role of a tough western rancher named Tom Donovan. John Wayne was first featured in Episode 2, Chisholm, 1970. And yes, in this movie he calls people Tenderfoot and Pilgrim. James Stewart, or Jimmy Stewart as I like to call him, played the role of Ransom Stoddard, eastern lawyer and newcomer to the West. Jimmy Stewart was first featured in episode 53, It's a Wonderful Life, 1946. Edmund O'Brien played Dutton Peabody, the founder and editor of the Shinbone Star newspaper. He was also a very talented drunk. O'Brien was first introduced in episode 30, Birdman of Alcatraz. Andy Devine played the role of town marshal Link Appleyard. Andy Devine was first introduced in episode 61, Stagecoach, 1939. He played the same character in both, married to a Mexican lady with lots of relatives, the father of a dozen kids, always hungry, and a big coward. John Carradine played Major Cassius Starbuckle, the mouthpiece for the rich cattle barons north of the Picket Wire River. John Carradine was first introduced in Episode 12, Billy the Kid vs. Dracula, 1966. Willis Boucher played the role of Jason Tully, train conductor. This role is only important because he delivers the last line of the movie. Willis Boucher was introduced in episode 37, The Violent Men, 1955. Denver Pyle played Amos Carruthers, who was a background character often seen playing cards. Denver Pyle was introduced in episode 49, The Alamo, 1960. Strother Martin played Floyd, one of Liberty Valance's toadies. The great Strother Martin was first introduced in episode 3, McClintock, 1963. Woody Strode played the role of Pompey, the assistant to Tom Donovan. Woody Strode was first introduced in episode 61, Stagecoach, 1939. Vera Miles played the role of Miss Halley, the love interest of the two male leads. Vera Miles was born in Kansas in 1929. By 1948, she won the title of Miss Kansas. The beauty title led to roles in Hollywood and it wasn't long before she was spotted by two of the greatest directors of all times. John Ford started casting her in westerns such as The Searchers, 1956, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962, while Alfred Hitchcock thought she was the new Grace Kelly. Where was the old Grace Kelly? She went off to marry a prince. Hitchcock cast her in The Wrong Man, 1956, Vertigo, 1958, and Psycho, 1960 although she had to withdraw from Vertigo 1958 due to a pregnancy. She became a persistent star in movies like The FBI Story 1959, Backstreet 1961, and Sergeant Riker 1968. She was also popular on television. Miles retired in 1995, never reaching the stardom she deserved. Lee Marvin played the evil Liberty Valance, hired gunman for the cattle barons. Lee Marvin was born in New York City. I'm seeing a trend. I'm walking here! I'm walking here! To wealthy parents. Marvin was thrown out of dozens of schools until he ended up at St. Leo's Preparatory School in Florida. He was thrown out of there as well. When your guidance counselor says you have no future, see your local Army, Navy, Marine, or Air Force recruiter. Marvin joined the Marines and fought in World War II. At the Battle of Saipan in June 1944, Marvin was shot in the buttocks, severing his sciatic nerve. I understand you were wounded. Where were you hit? In the buttock, sir. Oh, that must be a sight. I'd kind of like to see that. He was medically discharged from the Marines. 
Marvin did receive the Purple Heart and is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. There has been a consistent rumor that Marvin stated on the Johnny Carson Show that he served under the bravest Marine ever at the Battle of Iwo Jima, Bob Keeson, a.k.a. Captain Kangaroo. However, Snopes.com says this was not true, and while both men were Marines, Keeson never saw action. Mr. Rogers was not a war hero either. After Marvin's discharge, he was working as an apprentice plumber in Woodstock, New York. While fixing a toilet at a community theater, he was asked to replace a sick actor for rehearsal. He got bit hard by the stage bug. He started doing stock work and off-Broadway. His first movie role was You're in the Navy Now, 1951. He went back to Broadway for Billy Budd and then off to Hollywood to become one of the greatest villains of all time. He was in Eight Iron Men, 1952, and then The Big Heat, 1953. That same year, he played opposite Marlon Brando in The Wild One, 1953. The next year, he was in The Kane Mutiny, 1954, with Humphrey Bogart. Marvin took time to do television in the police detective series M Squad, 1957-1960. He did two westerns with John Wayne, The Comancheros, 1961, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962. Perhaps his greatest role, and the one for which he earned an Oscar, was Cat Ballou, 1965, where opposite Jane Fonda, he played a washed-up, drunken gunfighter named Kid Shaleen. He also played his twin brother, who was an evil, noseless killer, who I'm pretty sure is a copy of Liberty Valance. Of course, he played Major Reisman in The Dirty Dozen, 1967, one of the greatest war movies of all time. He was in Hell in the Pacific, 1968, battling Tashira Mafuni's character, he played the drunken gold miner Ben Rumson with Clint Eastwood and Gene Seberg. He fought train man Ernest Borgnine in the severely underrated Emperor of the North, 1973. I am very partial to his role as a tough sergeant in The Big Red One, 1980. His last film, before he died of a heart attack in 1987, was the terrible but fun The Delta Force, 1986, where Chuck Norris helps us win battles that we have lost. Ken Murray had a background role as Doc Willoughby. Born in 1903 in New York City, I'm walking here! I'm walking here! Murray was the son of a vaudevillian comic and learned the business. He worked in the declining years of vaudeville and then began filming with a 16mm camera in Hollywood. His movies of stars began to be used by Columbia in a series called Screen Snapshots. Beginning in 1942 and continuing for seven years, he ran... Ken Murray's Blackouts, a mix of risque humor, sexy young starlets, music, and novelty acts. He only had a few roles like this one in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Jeanette Nolan played Nora Erickson, a worker at Halley's Steakhouse. She studied acting at the Pasadena Community Playhouse and debuted for Omar Khayyam in 1932. Her first film role was as Lady Macbeth opposite Orson Welles, and her final film was as Robert Redford's mother in The Horse Whisperer, 1998. In between the two movies, she had more than 300 television and movie roles. She died at the age of 86 in California. John Qualen played Peter Erickson, the cook at Halley's Steakhouse. John Qualen moved to the U.S. from Norway. He won an oratory contest and was given a scholarship to Northwestern. During this time, he became interested in acting. He went to New York in 1929 and found work with director John Ford in Aerosmith, 1931. He quickly became part of the Ford family. He worked with Ford for the next 35 years. One of his greatest roles was Muley in The Grapes of Wrath, 1940. In all, he had over 200 roles, including parts in The Searchers, 1956, and Casablanca, 1942. He died in 1987. Carlton Young played the 1910 editor of the Shinbone Star newspaper, Maxwell Scott. Young went from Broadway to Hollywood in 1936. He started getting small film roles, and the most well-known of these would be Reefer Madness, 1936. He began getting larger roles in westerns and was in Dick Tracy, 1937. He was in a lot of odors at Republic. Young continued to make westerns through the 1940s. He slowly became a favorite of director John Ford, resulting in his casting in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962. He also appeared in film noir such as Kansas City Confidential 1952 and fantasy movies like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea 1954. 
Young retired in 1970 and died in 1994. Lee Van Cleef played Reese, and he was the second toady for Liberty Valance. Born in New Jersey, Van Cleef served in the Navy during World War II on a minesweeper and sub chaser. Following the war, he began working as an office administrator, but began acting in his free time. He had a non-speaking role as Jack Colby in High Noon 1952. His hawkish nose and slit eyes established him as a villain, and so his career went. Some of his greatest villain roles include the film noir, The Big Combo, 1955, Clint Eastwood's For a Few Dollars More, 1965, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, 1966. His looks seem to keep him always in the realm of the heavies. Finally, Sergio Leone cast him as a tough but decent Colonel Mortimer opposite Clint Eastwood in For a Few Dollars More, 1965. He was also the guy that sent Snake Plissken over the wall and escaped from New York, 1981. He had a short run on television as a ninja in The Master, 1984. He continued to make movies until his death in 1989. Joseph Hoover played the role of Charles Hasbrook, a very young reporter for the Shinbone Star. Born in 1932, this actor is only mentioned because of two other movies he starred in. Hell is for Heroes, 1966, and The Astro Zombies, 1968. Story. This movie begins in 1910, showing a train moving through the vast countryside. This is a John Ford Hallmark. The train pulls into the town of Shinbone, and an elderly Link Appleyard, Andy Devine, nervously waits. Miss Halley, Vera Miles, and Senator Ransom Stoddard, James Stewart, get off the train with the help of the conductor, Jason Willis Beauchet. A local reporter, Charles Hasbrook, Joseph Hoover, finds out that Ransom is a senator and he goes running for a story. Ransom agrees to give an interview only because Dutton Peabody, Edmund O'Brien, the founder of the Shinbone Star, once fired him. As Rance, Halley, and Link load in the buckboard, the current editor, Maxwell Scott, Carlton Young, comes over to take the senator for the interview. Link and Halley talk about the desert, the Cactus Rose, and head out to see an old abandoned farmstead. They pick a beautiful cactus rose. Back at the newspaper, Rance tells the men that he came for purely personal reasons. The editor says he needs a better story than that. Rance tells them that he is in Shinbone for the funeral of Tom Donovan, John Wayne. The newspaper men don't even know who Donovan is. The group goes to the Undertaker's building, and in addition to the coffin of Donovan, there are the relics of the Old West, like a stagecoach. In the corner, Pompey, Woody Strode, Donovan's friend and assistant, is holding vigil. The newspaper crew follows them in and ask again for the story. Sir, I don't wish to intrude, but a United States senator is news. I'm the editor of a newspaper with a statewide circulation. I've got a responsibility to know why you came all the way down here to bury a man. Now, you can't just say his name was Tom Donovan and leave it at that. Who was Tom Donovan? He was a friend, Mr. Scott, and we'd like to be left alone. Scott, let's go. Let's... I'm sorry, Senator. That's not enough. I have a right to have the story. Ransom begins to tell the story, and it goes back in time 25 years. Ransom tells him that he came by stage when he first arrived. He was fresh from law school. The stage is held up by four men. They take Ransom's father's watch, and when they try to take a pen from a lady, Ransom tries to defend her. The leader of the robbers is Liberty Valance, Lee Marvin. Valance uses a silver riding crop and beats Ransom senseless and leaves him for dead. The next morning, Donovan and Pompey find Ransom and bring him into town. They drop him at Halley's Steakhouse. Nora Erickson, Jeanette Nolan, and Peter Erickson, John Qualen, who work and live at the steakhouse, come in to help as well. They tell Ransom that the man with the silver whip is Liberty Valance and that he works for the cattle barons. Donovan says you have to kill out West, and Ransom says he wants to put him in jail. What did what, what, you say his name was? The, the man with the silver knobbed whip? I said Liberty Valance. <gasps> But if that's what you gotta do, you better start packing a handgun. A gun? I, I don't want a gun. I don't want a gun. 
I don't want to kill him. I want to put him in jail. Peter brings the marshal, Link Appleyard. Link is a coward and is terrified that they want him to go after Liberty Valance. Link says he has no jurisdiction for stuff that happened outside the city limits. Link is perpetually hungry and always eating on credit. Well, the, the jail's only got one cell and the lock's broke and I sleep in it. I dang well should have known nothing would happen when you came in here. Now go on, get out of here, you big old fat water buffalo. Get out of here, we got work to do. Hallie, I ain't that yet. You know, I could sure use a snack, uh, six or seven of those hen's egg, and maybe a side order of bacon, and hey, is that flapjack batter you're mixing? On the cuff. Sit down. Papa, go put your pants on. Oh, oh, yeah. The town has a saloon across from the steakhouse and a Mexican cantina next to the Shinbone Star newspaper. The founder of the paper, Dutton Peabody, goes outside and sees Link hiding from Valance. Peabody goes to the steakhouse for dinner. Ransom is washing dishes in the steakhouse to earn his keep as he heals. He reads law books as he washes. He finds the jurisdiction issue and asks Hallie to read the passage. She says she can't read and gets upset. He says he can teach her to read and she says he looks silly in his apron. Peter and Nora argue about whether Donovan should propose to Hallie. Link comes in the back door and mooches some more food. Link almost climbs inside his shell when Ransom tells him that he wants him to arrest Valance. Hallie asks for the reading lessons, and Nora says she wants to learn as well. Donovan comes in dressed up and gives Hallie a beautiful cactus rose. Pompey plants the cactus, and Donovan tells Ransom to be a lawyer, he will have to carry a gun. Donovan joins Peabody at the dinner table. Shortly after, Liberty Valance and his two toadies, Reese, Lee Van Cleef, and Floyd Struther Martin, come in. They just take the food away from three guys and run them out of the restaurant. Everyone is showing fear except Donovan. Balance goes on about how the town has been spreading lies about him being a robber and such. Peter asks Ransom to take Donovan's food out, and he does, wearing an apron. When Ransom walks by, Balance trips him. <laughs> Looking at the new waitress. <laughs> <laughs> That's my steak, Valance. Donovan steps up and demands Valance pick up the steak. Liberty says three against one until Donovan points out Pompey holding a rifle on them from the kitchen. When Floyd tries to pick up the steak, Donovan kicks him in the face. Ransom grabs the stake and stops the killing. Valance and his toadies leave and shoot up the town. Donovan again warns Ransom to get a gun because Valance will be back. Donovan tells Hallie that he will be out of town for a while, horse trading. Ransom begins working at Peabody's office and hangs out his law shingle at the Shinbone Star. The edition of the paper shows that the cattle barons north of the Picket Wire River are opposing statehood. Link comes in to check on his half a dozen Mexican children. Sounds familiar? Yeah, it's the same as Stagecoach 1939. In the back of the newspaper office, Ransom is teaching a very large reading class of all ages. He also teaches them about government. He explains about the statehood issue and the need to vote. Donovan returns after three weeks and chastises Pompey for taking classes. He tells them that Valance has been recruiting hired guns to fight a war for the cattle barons. Donovan tells them that he was ambushed and he had to kill one of them. Donovan tries to send Hallie out of class and she throws down on him. Peabody tells Hallie that Ransom has been practicing with a gun so he can fight Valance. Hallie tells Donovan and he catches up with Ransom to give him a lesson. At Donovan's ranch, they are building a room so he can propose to Hallie. Donovan has Ransom shoot at some cans on the ground. It goes very poorly. Donovan asks Ransom to set paint cans on the post, and when he sets the middle one, Donovan shoots the can and covers Ransom with white paint. Ransom knocks Donovan to the ground, and for the first time, Donovan sees that there is more fight in Ransom than he thought. On election day, all the men gather at the saloon to vote for delegates to the state convention. Greetings. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Ah, I'll have the usual deck. Bar's closed. The bar is closed, Mr. Editor, during voting. You can blame your lawyer friend. 
He says that's one of the fundamental laws of democracy. No exception. No exceptions for the working press? Uh, that's carrying democracy much too far. Ransom nominates Donovan, but he refuses. Donovan turns around and nominates Ransom. About that time, Balance and his toadies show up and demand he be elected. They make threats, but the town folks hang strong. You sad buses are a brave bunch when you're together. But don't vote anyway now, that you'll regret later when you're alone. The three nominees are Valance, Ransom, and Peabody. Valance only gets votes from his toadies. Valance tells Ransom to get out of town or be on the street to fight that night. Donovan recommends he flee. That night, Peabody is drunk as usual. He goes out for whiskey and finds Link hiding by the cantina. When he returns, Valance and the two toadies are waiting. They beat the hound out of him and destroy the newspaper office. Hallie is mad because she thinks Ransom is leaving. Valance et al. shoot up the town as they head to the saloon. Ransom finds Peabody and sends Link to tell Valance that he is coming out in the street to fight. Ransom goes to get his gun and Hallie sends Pompey to get Donovan. In the saloon, Valance is playing poker and guess what hand he has. That's right, aces and eights. The old dead man's hand. Gettysburg, you've heard of Gettysburg. 240 Doc, amputations in one... Mr. Peabody's awful hurt and he needs you bad over at his office. Oh, what's the matter, Mr. Marshall? Somebody have an accident? So that's it. Another one of your accidents, huh, Valance? I'm looking forward to the day when it's you they'll be calling me for. Paid in advance. <laughs> Ransom faces Valance on the street, still wearing his apron. Valance shoots a water bottle near Ransom and then shoots the gun out of his hand. Ransom picks up the gun with his left hand as Valance fires in the dirt. Valance aims his gun and Ransom fires, killing Valance. Ransom goes back to Hallie and she says she is glad he stayed. Donovan comes in and sees the pair together hugging. He says he is sorry he didn't get back in time to help. The toadies are in the saloon trying to get support for hanging Ransom. Donovan beats the crap out of them and rages on everyone else. And I say if the marshal don't put Stoddard in jail, we ought to take care of him ourselves. I say we ought to hang him. That's right, hang him. Give him a rope necktie and let him swing. And a man to break around this town and feet. Donovan, in a drunken haze, goes to his ranch. The room for Hallie is ready. He sets the house on fire. He would have died except for Pompey comes in to save him. Ransom, Peabody, and others head off to the statehood convention, and it's a riot with trick riders on horses running up and down the stage, trick ropes, and long-winded speeches. One of the finest is by former Southern gentleman, Major Cassius Starbuckle. He places in nomination the name of Custis Buck Langhorn, the cattle baron anti-state candidate. Peabody nominates Ransom for delegate to bring law and order. Starbuckle calls him a killer. Well, I see this demonstration, but I can't believe my eyes. Is it possible? that such a representative body of honest, hard-working Americans can endorse a candidate for the Congress of our beloved country whose only claim to the office is that he killed a man. And about this time, Donovan comes in the hall. Ransom sneaks out during the debate. Donovan, who looks like he's been on a two-week bender, tells Ransom that the killer of Valance was, in fact, Donovan. Isn't it enough to kill a man with a, without trying to build a life on it? You talk too much. Think too much. Besides, you didn't kill Liberty Valance. They fade back to that night in the smoke of Donovan's cigar. They show the killing of Valance from Donovan and Pompey's view. Donovan says he killed Valance to make Hallie happy, and he was sorry he saved Ransom's life. Ransom is elected and has a long and distinguished career, while Donovan sinks into a life of no importance. Back in current times, the editor, Maxwell Scott, takes the notes from the reporter and destroys him. Scott says, This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, 
print the legend. Well, you know the rest of it. I went to Washington. We won statehood. I became the first governor. Three terms as governor, two terms in the Senate, ambassador to the court of St. James, back again to the Senate, and a man who, with a snap of his fingers, could be the next vice president of the United States. Well, you're not going to use the story, Mr. Scott? No, sir. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Ransom returns to the casket and sees a cactus rose on top of the casket. As they head back east, Ransom asks Hallie if she would like to return to Shinbone. She is very happy with that news. Ransom asks about the cactus rose, and Hallie says she put it there. Oh, I got a brand new spittoon for you, uh, Cuspidor, Hallie. And Luke the Engineer's got a full head of steam in this old tar bucket. We're going to make 25 miles an hour bust a boiler trying. And <laughs> we wired ahead to Junction City. They're going to hold the express for you. Rants in two days and two nights, you're going to be right back in Washington. Oh, thank you, Jason. Thank you, and I'm going to write a letter to the officials of this railroad and thank them for their kindness and for going to all this trouble. <laughs> you think nothing of it. Nothing's too good for the man who shot Liberty Valance. Donovan was the Cactus Rose. His murder of Liberty Valance allowed the good to happen. His price was the loss of Halley. He could be beautiful and do great things, all the good that Ransom received was the direct result of Donovan's actions. Murdering for good. The last line of the film is, Nothing is too good for the man that shot Liberty Valance. World famous short summary, City Boy Marries Country Girl. The EPUB for subscribers will be on the site for about two more episodes, so drop by and get your free copy. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please tell your friends, and if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show notes to my site. Beware the Moors.